Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and you're watching part two of a video on social behavior. And this, this particular video on social behavior is going to emphasize communication between organisms because in a group, if you're living in a society, you've got to be able to communicate your intentions. And these are both positive intentions and negative intentions. And so communication is one of the most critical means of displaying and advertising and discussing your intention with other organisms. And so this video is an attempt to look at this. And so if you look here at this uh, particular slide, you know, I, I put up this picture of um, Apple's iPad here. I mean, we could relate to this. Think of the importance of communication in our lives. Think about this you know, definition of this, that we depend on it. It's the transmission and reception of signals that we have between each other. And so one of the greatest inventions of humanity is the internet. And so this is the way in which we can communicate with one another uh, in vast distances. It's, it's most remarkable. And what's interesting about it is, let me just jump over here to the to this next slide, is that, you know, again, you can relate to this just simply texting or our, our cell phones or any kind of video uh, conferencing. It's, an, it's a remarkable ability that humanity has to communicate, but it isn't just related to humans. It isn't just the hallmark of humanity. Other organisms can communicate quite efficiently. And so this is what this video is about. And so, of course, you're familiar with some of these things. Like, for example, frogs are are definitely capable of communicating with one another. The male frogs are, can, can croak and, and, and uh, send out signals. And again, uh, fireflies are infamous for being able to uh, bioluminesce. They have the, the enzyme luciferase that's capable of glowing. And so let me show, show you some of the things I'm talking about. And so here's some frogs. And so, one, one of the things uh, is that you don't see the frogs, and uh, that's probably pretty good for the frog. Because, again, you don't want to be spotted uh, by a predator. And so, generally, auditory signaling, this is what we're talking about. They're not communicating visually, they're, they're communicating auditorily. So, by creating sound, they're able to convey their message and not necessarily be uh, vulnerable to predation. So, that, that, I find that be kind of interesting and then again <laughs> um, fireflies this is a video of um, a researcher in Utah who's very excited about fireflies let me let this play Start to analyze them and see what species they are the reason why people like fireflies so much is that they produce their own light and it's something that captivates us and beyond that the lights beautiful they come in greens and yellows and oranges they come out in large numbers and it's it's a pyrotechnics show. Firefly flashes or bioluminescence, the, the molecular structure of that has actually been used for a long time in medicine. You have two... Uh... So what, what's interesting about it is, you know, we might think that's a beautiful pyro, pyrotechnic kind of firework display, but in fact, the fireflies, their intention and what they're doing is they're communicating. And so it could be courtship or it could be evasive, if you're trying to avoid a predator. Uh, it's a number of reasons why organisms are communicating with one another. And so um, here's another example that's, uh, well, let me just go over some of these things that, uh, in general before we get into another example. So what, what I've been mentioning is that animals use signals in order to communicate. And what those signals can be, they could be visual, like we saw in the firefly. There could be flashes of color and that sort of thing. They could be chemical. So in other words, uh, pheromones are an example of that that's going to come up in the video, which are chemical messages uh, that can be picked up by olfactory sensation. You could smell these chemicals. Uh, they could be tactile or touch communication, or they could be auditory like we, like we saw with the uh, frogs. Now, the choice of communication is really related to the lifestyle of the species that you're studying and what, what is most conducive. So in other words, the frog likes 
the auditory. And here's another great example of communication in the uh, in the ocean. Here are some squid, and these reef squid, they have the most amazing visual, which is a, 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 the signal that they use to communicate. And you're like, well, what are they communicating? It could be courtship. It could be that male is is exhibiting color in order to to um, bring in a mate, uh, or it could be competitive. It could be some sort of intimidation uh, that males are exhibiting in order to sort of stand down and make another more submissive. So it could be competitive in nature. So take a look at this. This is a pretty cool uh, video uh, looking at um, visual signals in squid. Their skins are alive with signals of great sophistication. Not only can they warn that a predator is near, but they can even distinguish one predator from another. So they're using color to, to show that the barracuda is coming. Impressive. Males competing for the affections of a female engage in a kind of visual combat, displaying spectacular colors and patterns. So two males. No damage is done. The contest is highly ritualized. If you recall this from another video, we call this uh, when they're fighting, but they're not really hurting each other, agonistic behavior. So they're competing and they're sort of pushing each other around, but there's no physical Squid damage. courtship is also very visual, a synchronized and extravagant display. So now they're using it to court. Incredible, huh? We, we like to hear what they're saying. <laughs> What's fascinating is I've also um, read where the squid is so impressive that it over on like one side of what the, the squid, it could be using certain color flashes to attract the male. And then over on the other side, it's showing different colors to to the other males to back the other males down like don't come over here this is my girl and then over here it's showing it's like some goodness <laughs> uh, very very impressive and then again staying in the ocean what better example do we have in communication in the ocean than these wonderful uh, mammals these humpback whales and how they sing and the humpback whale song kind of reminds me of the the disney uh uh, animated movie Nemo uh, when Dory is trying to speak whale. <laughs> a male humpback whale sings to attract a mate. get the the point of that it's it's pretty awesome i don't know i i just seem to think that that's uh that's a pretty cool thing the whales singing and again uh so much unknown about that um you know obviously we've we've attempted to record these these sounds and try to uh decipher them but it's hard to know for sure what's going on so there's so so much unknown um you know clearly these are highly intelligent they're social they live in in pods and they're communicating uh, and what's fascinating is that the sound travels really well in the water and so obviously they're not communicating visually as much as they are auditorily although the thing is you know we we talk about how humanity at times can destroy the environment and habitat on the land but we can also disrupt the habitat in the ocean by creating noise pollution in the ocean I've read some studies about how uh, so much so much boating that's going on in the ocean is disrupting the whales' ability to communicate with one another, and they're, so they're less likely to be able to hear each other, and so it's, that's kind of sad. So again, what we need to do is research it a little bit more, figure out what what the what this is all about, and then maybe make some policy to, to in order to manage it the sound a little bit better. So that's that's a, the positive approach. So. 
look at look at this wolf here. I mean, what do you think it's trying to communicate? <laughs> I, I think I'm getting the message uh, that it's pretty angry. It's flashing its teeth. So this is what a visual. It could be uh, tactile if it, if it throws a claw or it could be um, howling. And again, that's an auditory one, too. And so all of these things are uh, chemicals. It could be auditory, visual, tactile. There could even be electrical signals that, that are uh, part of the communication. It could be some sort of singing or dancing or all of these things. And I mentioned chemical. One of the, one of the great uh, ways in which uh, insects in particular communicate is, is using pheromones. Now, for, pheromones are kind of like hormones. They're chemicals. But hormones are secreted by cells internally, and what they do is they travel through the bloodstream and they, they communicate intention to cells to do something uh, to affect the metabolism of that cell. Now, pheromones are, are chemicals through odors that they, uh, they admit to the outside. And so we may not even be able to sense these, but of course, termites can follow each other uh, using these chemical trails and ants can follow each other using these chemical trails and bees use pheromones and they're effective at very very small concentrations and so that that's most impressive i was just hearing the other day on the radio that uh, scientists are investigating the use of bees and they're trying to train bees which uh, respond to pheromones uh, to, in order to detect uh, explosives like landmines. Sadly, uh, in the Middle East, there's a lot of landmines, and so they're trying to uh, uncover these landmines by training bees to detect um, chemical messages of, of TNT, and so they're able to use bees, sort of like pheromones, in order to determine where the landmines are. And so ants... Um, there's so much coolness with the ants. If you really like ants, then you'll like one of the great biologists of all time, uh, Edward O. Wilson, uh, who studied ants his whole life. And so, uh, again, chemical messages that, uh, that are secreted and that can send uh, information and communicate. And so even fish can do this. Like, for example, if minnows are... If you're messing with a minnow or one's harmed in some way, it'll actually start to secrete... Uh, a substance that then diffuses in the water and it causes um, sort of a, a fright response where all the other minnows sort of like coy into the corner to avoid the, the, the harmful scenario, whatever it may be. And since we've isolated this chemical, all you have to do is add this small quantity of pheromone into the water and all the fish do that. It's kind of interesting. And so Boy, what other organism epitomizes communication more than the bee? Boy, bee, the, if you have time in life, I, I, I recommend studying bee society. It's quite remarkable, to say the least. And so honeybees are, have this incredible ability. As you know, here's their hive. And what they could do is they could fly out and they get nectar from, the, from flowers. And then they bring that back to the hive in, in order to create honey. And so what's interesting is when a worker flies out and finds uh, some, uh, some nice blossoms, you ready for this? It's able to go back to the hive and by performing a dance, okay? So this is not a um, auditory, but rather a sort of a physical sort of visual dance. And the dance is able to communicate to the other bees where the flowers are. And so it's able to determine the position of the food source. I, I know it sounds re remarkable, but it's true. So the bees are able to maximize their foraging strategy by communicating with one another in terms of the distance that the flowers are from the hive and even angle, if you can believe this, using, using the sun. And so how about this? If the bees, this is the, one of the workers right here that's just come back from the hive and it's going through a dance and the other, the other workers are checking it out to see like, well, what's the story? Where's the flowers? And so as it turns out here, if the, if the bee does sort of what is called a round dance, it rotates around and around and around like this, that indicates, remarkable how we know this, it indicates how 
close the flower is. And so the, if it circles, then the food is near. And so the, the bees can, can learn that. And so here it is. The bees are literally clustered around the worker trying to get a sense of where the, where the flowers are. And this is the one that's just out of hand in terms of it's so remarkable. This is called the waggle dance. You got it. You got to. You got to see this. So if, if the bee, the worker, when it returns, when it goes across like this, here's the hive, and so it waggles when it goes in a straight line. This is the waggle part. It's like it's waggling its body back and forth, and then based on its, its turn, the angle of its turn is the angle using the sun. Like for example, it's 30 degrees, so they're able to communicate the actual angle and rotation of flight that the other bees have to go in order to find the flower. Okay, you have, you have to see this. Words cannot describe it. So, <laughs> take a look at this. There's a lot of videos, again, on YouTube investigating this. This is just one that I've chosen, but there's others if you want to check out the round dance and, and, the, and more waggle dance. Also, and let me point this out. This may sound a little silly, but there's... If you recall in your youth watching uh, the Magic School Bus, if you wanted to call up Magic School Bus uh, Honey Bee, it's, there's, a great, uh, there's a great cartoon of, uh, I think it's Miss Frizzle or something like this, uh, where they study the waggle dance with bees. It's really funny. So check this out. Here's the waggle dance. Honey bees have some fascinating abilities, among them being able to communicate by performing That's a unique waggle. dance. It informs hive mates where a newly discovered food source is located. Every cycle of this waggle dance roughly describes the shape of the figure eight. Yeah. Let's rewind and look in more detail. The bee only waggles on a part of its route, the straight run, indicated here by the waved line. Waggle. The secret lies in the direction of the straight run, and turn. or to be more precise, in the angle between the straight run and the perpendicular, okay. which in this case is 90 degrees to the left. This tells the other bees that food is available 90 degrees to the left of the sun. If the angle is 60 degrees to the right, they'll be flying 60 degrees to the right of the sun. Um, I, you know, again, uh, the thing is, you know, if I, if I may just take an opportunity here to, to mention something, you know, the thing about biology, it's the study of it. It's not as much of a pursuit of information as it is as a, uh, marvel. It's like, I think that's, that's what draws us to it. It's not only the love of nature, but it's marveling at it and, and being impressed at what other organisms can do. Because I think that's what generates the interest. It's not, you know, she who knows the most is the greatest biologist. It's she who's most excited about it and most curious about it. I, I think that there's a lot to that. And th to me, this is outrageous. <laughs> the communication. And so, again, um, this is the last concept that we have to talk about in terms of, of animal behavior. And, you know, I mentioned uh, previously that there's sort of this continuum of innate behaviors, which are controlled uh, by majority of, of genetics. And then there's learned behavior, and there's a whole uh, gamut of in between a continuum. But if one were to place uh, what is at the top in terms of the hierarchy of behavior. What what what's the most impressive behavior? I'm gonna have to. And again, this is su subjective comment. I'm gonna have to put this behavior on the very top as being the most impressive behavior of all. This is called altruistic behavior. I'm not sure if you've heard of it before. Maybe you have. And it's a social behavior that puts another organism over your own self-interest. And so, you know, biology likes to be, uh, you know, when you discuss biology, it's like, it's all about survival. It's all about, I, I have to live. I have to get food. I have to find a mate. I have to have offspring. Well, this is a behavior that organisms display that puts themselves in harm's way in order for others to benefit. And so it's a selflessness behavior. And so just bear with me on this because it seems kind of, uh, not very intuitive because if you're going to put yourself in harm's way and maybe even die, how in the world can natural selection promote that? 
In other words, organisms that are dying, how can selection, think about that. So what I'm talking about here, and this has come up uh, in, in another episode where animals are able to, to give alarm calls and monkeys are able to do this. And like, in other words, like when a giant snake is coming, it's actually able to shout out the danger is coming. And in so doing, it really puts itself out. It puts itself in harm's way so that others will benefit. And so one of the classic, and this is like, you'd find this in most biology textbooks, one of the classic examples of altruistic behavior, which is, you know, the, again, the definition of it is a decrease in your own fitness, but an increase in the fitness of others is in these uh, naked mole rats. <laughs> Can you believe there's these moles that live in in burrows, usually in Africa, usually in, in the southern part of Africa and the su southeast part of Africa. And they live in these colonies. And there's like a couple of hundred of them, literally, in these colonies. And of course, they don't really need a lot of fur because they're under the ground and they, they have very poor vision. They're almost blind. And the thing about it is there's one queen, which is the only organism in the whole colony that can bear children. And so what, what's up with that? So as it turns out, there's one reproducing queen. And so she mates with either just one male. Okay, we're talking a couple hundred moles now. So it mates with just one, maybe two or three. So these, if she's the queen, the ones that get to mate with her are the, are the kings. And so what are, what's all the other ones doing? So the, all the other males and females are non-reproductive, which means that really their whole life is sacrificed so that the king and queen can survive and have children. And so this means like going out on a limb. That means like a warning when their snakes are coming or it, go, it means bringing food back to, to, the, uh, to the cavern and it's doing all these things. And so again, bees exemplify this as well. Like here's the queen, can you see this down? The queen's kind of large and all these workers are basically uh, in a society and they, they never get a chance to reproduce. And what they do is they labor on behalf of the, of the fertile, single fertile queen. And so not only do they do that, but they'll actually go as far as sting intruders, which means that they're going to actually die as a result of, of that process. And so how can altruistic behavior be maintained by evolution? Um, well, you know, let me, let me go about it this way. Like for example, you know, this is a kind of a, a brutal scenario, but if you're walking down the street and you see like uh, an out of control bus or something coming down a steep hill and it's lost its brakes and you see like a small child who's in harm's way, I mean, how far do you go with that? Like you have the ability to go out there and push that child out of the way to save its life and then put yourself possibly in harm's way, even fatally. Now, where does this come from? I mean, where, where does this altruistic quality about animals, where does it, where does it originate? I mean, it's a, it's a profound question. It really is. And you say, well, I wouldn't do that. I, I'm not going to go out there and save some, some kid on the street. You're like, well, let me bring it close. Like, would you do that if it's your own child? You know, and you're like, well, of course. Would you do it for your brother and sister? Of course. Your parents, of course. Well, this can be studied, like in other words, relatedness, this could be studied uh, quantitatively in biology. And so it's something called inclusive fitness, because I think you may know that we have genes in us, but our, our offspring share 50% of that. And then our cousins share that those sequences as well. And so closely related family members by saving individuals inclusive to our family we're ultimately what we're doing is saving ourselves a little bit and so i know it's a little bit hard to grasp but it's the this inclusive fitness it's defined as the effect of an individual has on proliferating in other words passing its own genes on by reproducing and helping relatives okay so in other words helping raise offspring of the of other family members in fact you're actually doing a better you're doing a selfish act okay so it is a little bit of selfishness in the end when it comes down to it and so 
there's a, a professor who has studied this and put it sort of a mathematical quantitative approach to this. Um, it's called Hamilton's rule. And so you can actually predict that organisms, and I can, I can sort of summarize it, that your more animals are more likely to put themselves in harm's way to protect closely related family members because that, that assures the fact that their genes are going to be perpetuated in the next gene pool. So in the end, you know, like what is the defining behavior? It, it's what is it about humanity? Is there any behavior, social behavior that is inherently intrinsic to humanity? In other words, it separates us. I mean, over the years, yeah, I'm not sure if you followed the history of this, but we used to think that, ah, tool use. This is what humanity is, or is all about, is, is tools. But then, of course, other animals can use tools and manipulate tools. And then it's all, well, insight. Well, then chimpanzees show insight. And uh, uh, being self-aware, other organisms can show that. And so all altruistic behavior, no other, or, well, other organisms do this as well. And so is there anything? I'm not sure if I can really answer that question to your satisfaction, but, I, but I'm but i willing to pose it though. Well, I could say one thing that, that's, that maybe most can agree on. It's that, that no other species really comes so much close to matching our ability to learn and to pass on culture to our offspring. This is really, really important to us, passing on culture and teaching children about how it is to be a human. And so let me let me explain what I mean by that. And so this is such a huge uh, discussion that it actually falls into a different discipline called sociobiology. I welcome you to study it. But human behavior, uh, you know, like that of other species, is really determined by natural selection, its genes and environment. And so you have to think that this ability to store our information. I mean, I don't see other animals that have been able to create the most impressive libraries. And why do we do that? Why do we put our, our knowledge into books? Why do we create an internet? Why do we have schools uh, where we pass on not only information, but as you can see this picture right here, it's really enduring. Like you might say that there's no real reason, biological, biologically speaking, to maintain elderly in the population because they're not passing on any more genes into the next, they're not reproducing and they're using a lot of resources. But indeed, what they do play a tremendous role because they're teaching and educating. And through education, our species is able to endure. Through education, we're able to learn from the mistakes of our predecessors and we're able to make adjustments. And so, you know, sometimes mistakes are thought of to be negative things, but indeed what they do is they lead us to the right answer. They lead us to the road of success in the end. And you can never improve unless a mistake is made. And so culture and our, our parents and our grandparents help us to establish these things. And so really there may be no continuum between humans and other animals. And again, that's, that's something that's profound too. I think it, it'll it shows us that we should have respect for all living things on the earth and that all living things have uh, wonderful uh, contributions and it's all valuable. So I hope you enjoyed this part two video on social behavior with an emphasis on communication. Thanks for watching.